everyone. Welcome to the very, very first episode of my Dork Cast. We wanted to talk today about advanced analytics, and I think I have quite a background. I took a couple of our courses on Coursera. I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, and I was going to talk to you about the amazing things I could do with VLOOKUPs in Excel, and, and, and you'd be like, no, that's not advanced analytics. So instead, I brought a couple of real people um, on board. I'd like to introduce you to Tim and Nathan. If you guys would like to go ahead and introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about your background besides what Holiday Inn Expresses you stayed at. Yeah, thanks, Dalton, and, uh, and thanks for inviting, on, uh, inviting us on the show with you. Uh, I'm Nathan, and sitting here with me is Tim Wright. We work for the, uh, the data science practice at Access Group. So our day job is essentially to use these open source tools like Python and R to perform advanced analytics. Um, we like to do a lot of things like optimizations, predictions, uh, things like that. But recently, actually, uh, June 2017 release of ClickSense, they just came out with an integration for advanced analytics with ClickSense. Uh, so there's now a way to interface the ClickSense front end directly to Python and R servers, uh, which we thought was pretty cool. So we, if we move on. So what we're looking at here is the integration between the Sense program, the, the server or the desktop version, and the custom functions from Python R, uh, C++, Java, whatever you want to do, it runs through gRPC. So you can pretty much use whatever language you want to. But the idea is that you can take data from the click model, transfer it through the pipe to the open source engine of your choice, and then transfer the results back to ClickSense after you've performed some analysis. So it's got some pretty cool functions. So we're going to run through a story real quick of how this can be used to solve a, a real-world business problem. So here we've got Brenda, who's a vice president of, of customer loyalty at her company. Uh, every month, she's got marketing budgets that she works on uh, on a weekly or daily basis. And she specifically wants to target her customers with different advertisements essentially to keep them engaged. So her team makes recommendations on who to target uh, and, that, and with what methods to target them for emails, text messages, et cetera. Hey, I think I've met Brenda before. She's a pretty tough cookie. You're going to have to have a really good story for her. She's not going to like you guys. Yeah, so this had to be really focused on solving her specific use case, which was trying to help her optimize the spend of her marketing budget. Uh, and to do that, we first did a predictive analysis on each of her customers um, looking at the customer attributes and the customer history based off of their interactions with Brenda's company. And we cross joined that with all of the different types of offers and came up with a predicted value for each different offer for each customer. So we would know what the probability of success and then could uh, estimate an expected profit from each customer based off the interaction. So that was the first step, but that only gave her some outcomes. It didn't actually optimize her decision. So we wanted to take that into ClickSense and let her put those budgets uh, in such a way that she can play around and experiment and come up with a, a robust way to solve this optimization problem. So now Tim's going to walk you through how that works in ClickSense uh, and, and show off some of the new Click advanced analytic capabilities. So Tim? All right. So let me go ahead and uh, get our sheet up here. Um, so this is just a basic. So wait a feature. second. Wait, wait a second. Are, are that that those slides you were showing me is that like the storyboarding feature in ClickSense? Yeah, exactly. So so we're using storyboarding right now. Um, we we think that's a really good way to show results to tell stories um, because it allows you to interface uh, sort of static text, insights, images, data um, with either snapshots of sheets or you can interact with. It. You know, move to a sheet um, and, and interact with it. So we, we, we find it. You exciting. guys are all right. So for data science guys, you get the whole idea of using a storyboard to tell the story, and now you're going to show me how you built the story. I love it. I love it. Yeah, so from the data science, our approach is less science projects and more building value. Uh, so all these different tools that people are used to seeing that can help people understand the context behind the data and build the value in an intuitive way, uh, we're, we're on board with that. So here you see um, this is a pretty uh, standard sheet object. Uh, not a lot going on here, but what's happening under the hood is, is actually pretty impressive. So here you can see you come to the sheet, and Brenda can go ahead and make her selections. So maybe she wants to optimize 
who are voted for our region. So maybe she wants the east and south region. And maybe she's specifically looking at targeting a few industries that have maybe been underperforming. So she goes ahead and she can select those. And what this is basically doing is filtering down her customer base. Um, and then from there, she's got certain budgets. So um, we've got a budget for emails, offer trials, et cetera, a whole bunch of options here. Um, and we can go ahead and say, all right, well, let's run the optimization and figure out who the best people to, to serve with what action. And you can see, so this is specific for that region, the east and south and those industries. Given her budget and costs, these are the best actions that she should take to optimize or maximize the expected profit that she's going to get. So at the end of the day, that is the business problem, right? It's we've got a marketing budget and we want some sort of return on it to our company. So what's going on under the hood is basically trying to to determine what decisions to, to maximize that outcome. So now, let me let me let me make sure I got this straight. So um, typically when I think of data science, it's I present one giant chunk of data. Somebody like you guys as data science goes off and runs it. You actually got this integrated with Sense through this AAI stuff to where she gets to choose her cohort and then go rerun it, even though she's not a data scientist? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it does require some work on the back end to formulate the problem correctly. But if you take that effort, yeah, there's no reason why um, any ordinary business user with no data science background at all can't come in here and go ahead and change her partner. So maybe, you know, she decides that she's got um, no phone call budget. So that goes to zero. Well, now you can see it automatically those phone calls run away on her optimal actions list because she no longer has the, the ability um, budget-wise to, to serve those. Um, oh, likewise, that's if, if your costs go up or down, uh, whatever sort of physical limitations to her ability to make actions, whether or not it's budget, cost, contractual obligations, those things can be incorporated into the problem sort of formulation in the back end so that all the user has to do is sort of interact with and say, yeah, these are the limitations within which I have to make my decision. Now, within those constraints, you know, what are the best decisions that I should make? That's awesome. So then all she'd probably need to do is like click on there for like some optimal action and like just choose the promo emails or the offer trials and, and she could like get right to those things then, right? Well, not exactly. So unfortunately, um, as powerful as the AAI is, um, the way this is actually working, and I can show you in the back end, but I'm going to try to click on this. You can see that I don't know if you can hear my clicking. But nothing's happening. Um, and the reason is because this is actually, it's not a dimension, it's a measure. Um, so oh, let's return I'd love, back I'd love the, to see, yeah, I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah. So let's go ahead and show you what that looks like. Um, so here's a table. Um, and the customer ID, if we actually look at it, you can see customer ID is customer ID. So it's just passing a dimension. Um, and what we're passing to the advanced analytics integration, which again, for us is a Python plugin, we've got a custom function here that takes customer IDs, which, you know, these are filtered on the front end of the user selection, and a whole bunch of parameters related to how much budget and cost uh, Brenda has to work with. Um, and you see here our, our custom function, we call it click dork just optimize, um, since we're going to be on your dork cast today. Um, but really what's going on here is this click dork is just an alias, sorry, this is an alias for the plugin. So you could have potentially different plugins that do have different customized functions within them. Um, and this is just an alias for ours. You can change this easily within the, uh, a settings file for ClickSense. Um, so, you so, the, so, so they could call that some other function like, you know, for fun, budget optimizing. But but I think if I remember correctly, if it's named ClickDork, it probably runs faster. Is that is that basically the gist of Python? Yeah, that's about, that's about the gist. The, the runtime is, is about an order of magnitude faster um, using the ClickDork trademark. Um, cool. No, that, so, that's what yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you were a marketing department and you had a bunch of these plugins, you might want to do, you know, marketing dot, you know, just optimize or optimization dot whatever. So this function, the second part here is the actual name of the function. So this has to be configured in the plugin and this doesn't change. I mean, you could, you could write it to change if you wanted to, uh, but this is an okay. alias and this is the function. This function takes this set of parameters, uh, which we're passing. Very good. In. Good. And for those of you listening later, if you haven't listened, read my blog or watched my videos, I do joke a lot. When it showed the click dork just optimize, it's really that's just a, an alias for a port number. So behind the scenes, 
they've got a settings file of different ports, and the Python is listening in on that port, so you would use a legitimate name there. So I want to make sure that you don't really think it has to be called ClickDork. Okay, so the problem here is that runs, so each cell gets those values right back from that port, but then we can't click on it. What, what's the basic architecture for this, and how can we fix this? Because otherwise, Brenda's going to scream at me. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, like you said, it, it is kind of limited, because if you wanted to do anything at the moment, you could go ahead and take this table and export it to Excel or, your, you know, Ouch, ouch, you're killing me, you're killing me. Exactly. So, that's, that. therein lies the rub. Um, so, to answer your first question is, how does this actually work? Um, let me talk about sort of the, the way a traditional... Um, object in a click sense front engine or front end is rendered. So you have your object, it could be a chart, it could be a table. Um, and what it does is it requests a data hypercube from the Kix engine. So it says, I need these dimensions and these measures. The Kix engine will go ahead and calculate that stuff and give it back the data um, so that it can render those on the front end. As you change your selections, new hypercube, it's recalculated and it returns the data to the front end to be calculated. So that's sort of the way Click traditionally works um, out of the box. We see advanced analytics integration um, that gets a little bit more complicated, uh, but it's the same basic concept. Again, on the front end, you've got a chart or an object. This time, your chart object may have a custom function that you've defined. So we had Click Dork just optimize. Um, what happens in the Kix engine is it will calculate all of the measures that it can using native click functions. So if there's sums and maxes and aggers, it'll return those values or it'll calculate them. And if it, if it sees a custom function that refers to a plugin, it'll go ahead and forward those on to the plugin. So in this in our scenario, it's forwarding on the just optimized with the data to Python. Python then takes that data, performs some calculations, and it returns the result to the Kix engine. So what we saw, it, it returned an expected profit and an optimal action. So it returned those two things to the Kix engine. The Kix engine would then combine those with the Hypercube measures that it was able to calculate. For us, there were none that were actually calculated by the Kix engine. And that data is all returned to the Hypercube so that it can be rendered in the front end. So Very that's, cool. That's how the integration that we just looked at um, functions. But as you noted, it's a little bit limited you can't really interact with the result set once it's returned back. So with permission, we're going to go ahead and show you uh, a slightly more advanced or enhanced version of that same dashboard. Um, let me go ahead and go to the sheet. And you'll see that there's a lot more information on this sheet. We've got some bar charts. We've got some KPIs. Um, but it's the same basic flow. Um, you can select some customers. You can select some industries if you want, you can select, um, and you're seeing as I'm doing these things, the results are actually filtering. Um, we've got budgets, so we'll go ahead and click run optimization. The data has been reloaded into the data model. So you can see there's no budget for promo emails, no budget for offer trials, but now I can actually click on those things um, and filter the data by those results. So now the entire result set has become a part of your traditional click experience where you're able to actually interact with those, um, those values. So the benefit is you can see who you targeted by region. Um, you can see region by customer, by offer type, basically the traditional um, experience that you would have with Click because now all of this stuff resides, all of this information resides in your data model. So um, if it's in the data model, how, how did you get it there? Because I would think the architecture would need to be a little bit different than what you just showed. Exactly, okay. So it does. Um, and I'll go ahead and walk you through um, the difference. I and love for those it. Of you, those of you listening, uh, don't become overwhelmed. There's a lot of steps. It's really not that different than what we just talked about. So is it, we're going to break this into a two-step problem, um, as you can see on, on the storyboard sheet here. Um, step one is essentially identical to what we had just showed previously with the AI, AAI architecture, the standard architecture. Uh, with two small caveats. The first is that the object on the front end that's passing the data is essentially a dummy object. So it's not a chart, it's not a table, it's some dummy object, a small button, or a text object. And its primary role is just to get the data from the click data model to the Python backend. 
So it works the same way. It sends the data to the Kix engine. Kix interprets that there's a server-side function or an AI function somewhere in there, and it passes the data and the function to Python. And then this is one of the other big sort of differences between this architecture. At this point, Python performs the calculations, but instead of returning calculation results to the Kix engine, it actually can write those out to disk. So that can be a text file, a CSV, it can connect directly to an ODBC, um, and it'll actually write the results to disk. Simultaneously, it'll return a dummy value, a dummy result, to the Kix engine and then to the front end. That could be something as simple as uh, a message saying uh, reload in progress, um, function called. Um, it's basically just to complete the function call. Then the next step, and this is step two, and this is the biggest difference, is that events from the front end can call a partial reload. So then Kix will go ahead, the Kix engine will go ahead and suck in all of that data that you just calculated from the advanced analytic engine. So it'll then pass that to QuickSense in every single object for which it's called. Um, and the cool thing here now is that because it's part of your data model, all of the results that you calculated up here at step four in your AAI call, all of those are exposed to your data model as measures, as dimensions, um, they have the same filterability as the rest of your data model, so it allows for a lot more interaction um, with your results. So, so step seven there, that button you were pressing, what it was really doing, it was really going through and doing like a reload of data, a partial reload of the data? Yeah, exactly. So that's actually, uh, for us, our dummy hypercube, it was actually a button object. So that button that I pressed was the dummy object. Um, and it got to, uh, sort of, as it executed, it changed its state to, say, partial reload, and I can show you that again in a minute. If okay. You like. And so um, then is that, that's a, I'm, a, I'm assuming that's like a, like a custom extension you guys have built? Yes. Yes. Very um, cool. Very cool. Really so learning all, learning all kinds of stuff. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and it, it, it's a relatively easy extension. It, it took me a, a, a few hours to, to write. Um, and it, it, for us, it just enhances the functionality so much. And for Brenda, it makes her job so much easier. Um, it allows her to run one scenario, run a different scenario, fully interact with those. Um, so it adds a lot of value, a lot of value to her. Great. Um, so as we look at this, yeah, that, no, that's perfect. Go, go ahead and move on. As we look at this, um, did, did, Brenda's got to be really ecstatic because she could consult to um, you guys, you, you guys write this click dork function for her or whatever her team really wants to call it, um, and now she's free to kind of play with it as she goes. Um, it looks like this slide is kind of talking through the story a little bit more. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So what we've done is, is use Brenda and her uh, customer satisfaction story to, to talk about research optimization in general. Uh, so her story abstracts the difficult parts of the optimization on the back end and gives her a friendly UI on the front end with, with which to interact with her data. Uh, but that same process can be applied to any number of different resource optimizations. You see uh, several here on the screen of uh, CapEx projects, traffic assignments, manufacturing processes. All of these different things have certain min or max values that you're trying to achieve, whether that's profit or cost, and then resource constraints. So the entire idea behind this is to optimize the use of your resource to achieve uh, a, a goal, essentially. Okay, let me give you guys a little bit of a test. We'll, we'll kind of end this uh, to see if you really stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, if you guys really have the background you say you do. Um, if this is a, any kind of resource optimization, I could probably provide you with a list of foods and their calories and fat intake, and, I, and you could run something like that to optimize my chocolate intake, is that correct? Exactly, yeah. So we could, we could program a set of rules and constraints with the goal of, say, cutting a 500-calorie deficit if you're trying to lose uh, 10 pounds or so. We could absolutely create an optimization that would help you do that. I love it. I love Not it because it, it's all about me and, yeah, it's, it's me and my chocolate intake. What if, you know, I've got, I've got I, I got to tell you, as much as I work, I've got a honeydew list that's really growing. What if I had, like, a list of the chores and the time it would take? Could I, could I use something like this to optimize my resources? Um, for, for my chores, my honeydew list. Absolutely. So this is generic for any sort of resource optimization. So in the real world, resources are scarce. 
Uh, you don't have unlimited time or unlimited money. Uh, when you have that honey-do list, you have a certain set of actions to take, and your time is constrained until, uh, I suppose, until your wife gets home. But Exactly. Any, that, yeah. <laughs> any set of, of defined rules like that can be set up into an optimization problem to help you achieve the most objects of your honey-do list before you run out of time. So absolutely. Fantastic. So if there's people out there looking at a sales and marketing budget and you found me, you, you love this. If you're a chocoholic like me and you figured that out, if, if you're a guy with a honey-do list, you can do it. But guys, I, I got to tell you, my, my main focus is the healthcare um, realm. And uh, so I'm going to give you a really complicated case and, and I, we'll see what the answer would be. I, I don't work with Deborah. I work with her sister, Penny Sillen. And uh, penicillin has to do nurse staffing. Is there any way that the same kind of thing could be used to identify, say, the complexity of people's cases and calculate values for that based on units, what nurses are available, how many hours they're able to work, what their costs are, to do something like crazy, like a nurse staffing projection? Uh, again, the answer is absolutely. So you would set up rules for each one of those things as far as staffing hours, the requirements for the number of nurses you need at a time in a certain uh, subsection of the hospital, uh, what their particular specialties are and all of those things. And then you can create that optimization that will most efficiently align those resources throughout the day or week. Um, so the answer is yes. And, and that's, if, if, if I'm really getting this, and I'm trying to tie it all back together for the people listening. Because of the fact it could be changed, and we could change because sometimes those things change. Patients shift in and out of units. Uh, nurses call in sick. They're not available. Somebody could really continually just keep making changes as the day goes on, push that button, and uh, with that architecture, it's recalculating kind of during the day as, you know, like life happens. Is that right? That, that's exactly right. So that's actually one of the reasons we decided to use Click to solve this problem. So typically when you're doing an optimization, you have to send that off to uh, a decision support team who's helping you align those resources. But in this case, we were able to take all of those rules, predefine them, and then give the user the ability to have the final say on exactly what the costs and, res and benefits of each of those resources are. So in this case, we were looking at um, budgets and costs per item. But you can easily realign that to uh, the nursing staff as well with the intent of giving the end user the ability to have the final say on how the model uh, performs. Fantastic. Um, so, guys, how would somebody get a hold of you if they wanted to do a, a, a project like this? Yeah, so here's our contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you've got any questions, if you're interested in learning exactly how we did some of this stuff. We'd love to talk to you about that, or if you have uh, some of your own stories to share, we'd love to be uh, involved with the community in that way. So feel free to, uh, to reach out to us with anything that you uh, want to talk about in this regard. Thank, th thank, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Tim. Um, for those of you watching, forget the click door goofiness. The whole point of this, I appreciate these guys, um, especially being my first door cast victims. Um, Data science, you're going to read these stories. You're going to see stuff in the news about marketing or about sales because those are things that have huge value, and there's huge ROI, and they love broadcasting those things. Um, when you read them, realize it's not about marketing. It was about resource allocation, and, and the resources could have been silly things like food and calories. It could be time and chores. It could be staffing. So as you're seeing these data science things in the marketplace, um, don't assume that they're limited to the financial industry. These could be things implemented for anything. Um, so guys, I appreciate your being on and, and helping get that point across. Appreciate your showing the, um, the, the flexibility of what the AAMI model is in terms of you can use it as an expression just like summer count. But you can also pretty easily with a partial reload, you can then get that into the actual data model itself and consume that, which I think was a huge step um, for our server-side extensions. Um, being able to configure those ports and set multiple things up, you don't need a name like ClickDork as your function name. It could be something a little more specific. I wish everyone the best of luck as you start taking advantage of these functions 
um, to really streamline the healthcare industry as well as anybody else who might happen to watch this by strictly by accident. Um, guys, hope you have a great day, and I hope your emails get uh, flooded with with uh, people begging um, to get something like this implemented. Have a great day, everyone.